Hi, welcome to the Matrix Algebra Talk. Um, and this will just be enough to get you through regression. So firstly, should you be here? So do you know what an estimator is? Do you know what bias is? Do you know if a high bias, low variance estimator is good or bad? If you don't know, please go to the basic statistics lingo, which was the first lecture in the series. Do you know what blue stands for? Um, do you know what simple linear regression is? How we estimate the parameters in simple linear regression specifically? I'm referring to the loss function or the, the function that we're, no, not the loss function, the function that we minimize to get the parameter estimates. And what is so great about Gauss-Markov? Well, if not, then revisit the simple linear regression and catch up and then come back to this. So here's our goal. We would like to add more model parameters to our model. So before we just stopped with one, but if we add more, it turns out that if you try to use calculus to estimate the betas, you are going to be sitting there for a while. And matrix math is gonna help us do that more swiftly. So it's time for linear algebra. So there are different ways of expressing matrices. Um, you can say things like A is a two by three matrix, which simply means your matrix has two rows and three columns. You can say A equals I, A, I, J, where I goes from one to two, J goes from one to three. I in this case is the row index, J is the column index. If you use MATLAB or R or something like that where you can work with matrices, um, it's the same idea because the first number always grabs the rows and the second number always grabs your columns. Or you could just simply write out the matrix. So we have A11, A12, A13 in the first row, and so on. There are some special matrices. Square matrices have the same number of rows and columns, and we'll see why that's special, or why a square matrix can be special in a little bit. And vectors are nice to work with um, because the math is easier, and you can either have a column vector or a row vector. The diagonal matrix is a special square matrix where you only have non-zero entries on the diagonal. And the identity matrix is a special type of diagonal matrix where you only have ones on the diagonal. So it's the matrix equivalent of the number one. And you might think it looks kind of dumb, but it's actually used quite frequently, especially when we're describing correlations of zero, which would be that matrix. Okay, um, transpose simply means you take each row and swap with the columns. So the first row becomes the first column. The second row becomes the second column. Likewise, you could just think of it as the first column becomes the first row. It's just the equivalent way of thinking about it. Typically denoted either with a, a with a T or A with a little um, dash up here. Uh, really depends. Addition is easy. You just do element-wise addition and subtraction. So you can check my math here. If you take the one, one element in the first row, first column, it's one, add that to the same uh, element of the second matrix, four, and you get five. Uh, repeat, it's two plus seven is nine, and et cetera. It's about this point when I was taking my first linear algebra class, because uh, I was a math major in undergrad, I was like, this is a piece of cake. Um, but then we got to multiplication and the, the equivalent of division matrix inverse, and uh, things got a lot harder. So in the case of matrix multiplication, you actually do not want your matrices to be the same dimension. So you can't take a two by three and multiply it by a two by three. Instead, the only requirement is that the number of columns in the first is equal to the number of rows in the second. So I often, when I'm working with matrices and I'm not looking at them, I'll write the dimensions. So I'll write three by two under here and then two by two under here. And I'll make sure that the column dimension of the first matrix uh, matches the row dimension of the second. I almost always do that when reading papers with uh, equations using matrices in letter form. Okay, so how do you do the multiplication? Um, well, you work across the rows of the first matrix and you work down the columns of the second. So there's this equation here 
But I feel like by the time you look at that and try to memorize it, you can just um, kind of use, I don't know, I almost use muscle memory because I learned to do this by kind of tracing my fingers over rows and columns. And what you do is you multiply elements together and then add. So I'm going to take a 1 times 4, it gives me 4, plus 2 times 1, which is 2, so 6. And then you repeat. So I'm going to go down uh, the second column now, and that'll give me, so since I'm using the first column of the first matrix and the second column of the second matrix, sorry, the first row of the first matrix, second column of the second matrix, that's giving me the uh, results for the first row, second column. So it's 1 times 2 plus 2 times 4. And then repeat to get the rest of the numbers. So that's it. Um, when we talk about contrast, that'll be, I think, one of the earliest times that we actually have to do matrix multiplication. And luckily there you're working with just a row vector and a column vector, so it's a little easier. The matrix inverse is what I feel like I spent most of my first linear algebra class doing. It's denoted by a raised to the power minus 1, and it's a matrix such that if I pre-multiply by a inverse or post-multiply by a inverse, I get an identity matrix. See, now the only way I can get a square identity matrix, um, if you think about this, is if a itself is square. So in order to have a matrix that I can pre and post multiply A by, um, the dimensions of A must be the same, the row and column dimensions. So this only exists for square matrices, but not all square matrices. They have to be what's called full rank. Um, I'm just going to use full column rank. In square matrices, it doesn't matter. You want all columns or rows to be linearly independent. I will go over this idea in a minute. Um, the inverse is not simply inverting each element, just as the multiplication wasn't an element wise, uh, but I'll spare you the details. We'll just we'll rely on software packages to invert our matrices for us. Okay, so I just said an inverse only exists if it's full rank. So how do you find uh, out if you're a rank deficient matrix? Well, you look to see if any column in your matrix can be reproduced as a linear combination of the other columns. So in this case, this is an easy one because um, the third column I can get by multiplying the first column by 2. So 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 3 is 6. So multiplying that first column times 2 gives me the third column. So this is rank deficient. That simply means that in terms of spanning space, if you think of matrices as describing things in space, these two columns are describing exactly the same thing. The second matrix here is rank deficient because if I sum the two, so that's a linear combination. Linear combination just means multiply it by a number, a scalar, and add it to another column multiplied by a scalar. So here are the scalars are just 1, so 1 times column 1 plus 1 times column 2 is column 3. So this is also rank deficient. Okay, well we're going to be, with our linear regression, we are going to need to invert a rectangular matrix. So there's a trick to doing this, and this works only if your columns are linearly independent. Um, if that's the case, then if you take A transpose A, that'll be invertible. So think about the dimensions here for a second. Let's say our matrix A is 100 by 4, then the transpose will be 4 by 100. So this thing here is going to be a 4 by 100 multiplied by a 100 by 4, so the result will be a 4 by 4. So it is square, and as long as the columns are linearly independent, it will be invertible. Then the pseudo-inverse for A is given by this. So this is uh, more Penrose. Uh, A transpose A inverse A transpose, and this only works with uh, multiplication on the left side. Obviously it won't work if we do it on the other side, but if we pre-multiply by the pseudo-inverse, we get the identity matrix. That's it. Whoa, this one's almost under 10 minutes. Amazing. Um, yeah, so the pseudo-inverse is actually going to be the star tomorrow. And 
multiplication of a vector with a vector, a row vector with a column vector, that's going to come back when we talk about contrast. So those are the things you really want to focus on. Let's see if you can answer these questions. What is a rank deficient matrix? I'm going to be posting um, matrices to the Facebook group to quiz you. Um, so just look at it and see if you can figure out if it's rank deficient or not. Um, hopefully people will maybe refrain from putting the answer in the comments if they do just don't look. Um, but here's an example. Is this matrix rank deficient? Can you tell by looking at it? Can you reproduce any one column by taking linear combinations of the other columns? I think so. How about this? Is this rank deficient? Yeah, sit here for a little bit, but um, you can also pause it and look at it and determine if you think that this is uh, rank deficient or not. How about this one? All right. Well, I'll let you think about those. You can, again, rewind and pause and stare at them for a little bit. If you want to know the answer, just ask on the Facebook group. Um, right, what needs to be true for a matrix inverse to exist? How do you invert a rectangular matrix? What property must the matrix have for this to be possible? So next time, like I said, we're going to put this to work. We're going to add some regressors to our model, and we're going to use that pseudo-inverse to get the job done. And I just want to thank you again. Um, check out the information box for links to everything. Please join the Facebook group. Please, you know, you can follow on Twitter if you want and other things. But I really hope people join the Facebook group. And thanks for being here. Um, and have a great day.